Are you finding that your child has a lot of cough, congestion, and it seems constant during this upper respiratory tract in season? Today we're gonna to talk about a few evidence-based tips and tricks for potentially reducing the number of days your child spends sick this season. Welcome to the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. As a pediatrician and mother herself, Dr. Rolnick is here to answer your most pressing parenting questions and guide you through the tough spots. Good morning. We're back uh, in the office at Be Kind Pediatrics today, um, and we're in full swing of upper respiratory tract viral season. And so I thought today we could talk a little bit about ways to naturally prevent or reduce the number of days that your child has an upper respiratory tract infection. So I'm going to refer to upper respiratory tract infections moving forward as URIs. And the first therapy I want to talk about, because um, we're going to talk about how it might affect uh, you rise at several different levels, is vitamin D therapy. Most people are aware that it plays a vital role in our bone health and the strength of our bones and making our bones. But what a lot of people don't know is that vitamin D is actually an essential trace element for our immune system. So outside of the bones, vitamin D actually plays a very large role in amidomodulation that is controlling our immune system um, and inflammation. And so it is one of the key nutrients found at helping our immune system fight off bacteria and viruses. Um, some other vitamins and minerals that we've talked about that also do this, of course, are vitamin C, which is very more famous for this, but also um, zinc and iron. The other important thing I think to know about vitamin D is that we know globally many, many children and adults are actually deficient in vitamin D. So vitamin D is um, made either from sunlight hitting our skin, um, or it can be obtained in our diet. And it actually usually has to be obtained both ways. Um, and with increasing concerns about sun exposure and appropriate use of sunscreen, we've actually seen um, more and more people becoming deficient in vitamin D. Um, and there's lots of other things that play a role in vitamin D deficiency, but we know that many people um, probably are not getting enough vitamin D. So the first study I want to talk about today was a study published in Lancet in 2017, and it was a systemic review and a meta-analysis of individual patient data. And the question they were really asking here was, is vitamin D supplementation associated with reduced asthma exacerbations? When they were done kind of filtering through the data, they wound up with about 1,000 patients, and what they found was that patients who received vitamin D supplementation had about a 25% reduction rate in the need for oral steroids. Um, and they looked at this data several different ways. So they looked at, did it matter if the individual was vitamin D deficient before they started vitamin D supplementation? Did it matter um, if the patient was um, female or male? Did it matter um, the ethnic or uh, racial background of the patient? Um, and they also looked at, it didn't matter if the patient was obese or not because we know that patients who are overweight or have a high BMI are at higher risk for having vitamin D deficiency. And they found actually no statistical difference between these um, different subgroups, but an overall reduction in the use of oral steroids in patients who were supplemented with vitamin D and who had asthma. So overall, I think that's pretty impressive data. Um, I think more importantly, what they found was there were no harmful side effects to vitamin D supplementation um, when used at the appropriate levels. And so it is a safe therapy um, that potentially has some benefit. So very little harm and the potential for some benefit for these patients. Now I want to talk about the data for the use of vitamin D specifically in upper respiratory tract infections or URIs. So the first study we're going to talk about was published um, in BMJ in 2017. Again, this was a systemic review and a meta-analysis of individual patient data. All of the studies in this group were double-blind randomized control trials. They had about 10,000 patients in this study, so a fairly large study. And we like to see studies with more patients because um, they are, have higher statistical power, meaning their results are slightly more meaningful. Um, and what they found was in patients who were vitamin D deficient that, um, and who were taking vitamin D supplements, that they were less likely to have 
your eyes than those who were vitamin D deficient and not taking vitamin D supplements. These results have been echoed in a few other randomized control studies, but there was another randomized control study looking at adolescent swimmers. So I think the process here, thought process behind this was um, swimmers tend to spend more time potentially inside if they're swimming in indoor pools. Um, but they looked at adolescent swimmers and they found that, again, adolescent swimmers who were supplemented with vitamin D, who were vitamin D deficient, um, had less URI symptoms than those who did not. And they also found, interestingly, um, that adolescent swimmers who were vitamin D deficient and who did not take vitamin D supplements um, had longer duration of URIs and tended to have or reported more severe symptoms or more severe URIs. And so now I think it's time to take just a step back and talk about what is vitamin D deficiency. So different groups um, in medicine have slightly different definitions for what vitamin D deficiency is. The Endocrine Society defines it as um, between 20 and 30 being insufficient and less than 20 as being deficient. The Institute of Medicine defines vitamin D deficiency as less than 30. So there are slightly different cutoffs here. Um, and most of these studies kind of went in between. So they used 25, less than 25 as a definition of vitamin D deficiency. So depending on what your vitamin D level is, it may be beneficial for you or your child to take a vitamin D supplement to both reduce the severity of URI illness as well as the duration or days that you spend with URI symptoms. Again, I think it's important to mention that in both of these studies, vitamin D was found to be safe with very few side effects. So again, we're looking for therapies that are have very little harm and potentially some to a lot of benefit. So I think, again, like the asthma studies, these additional studies had shown that there is very little harm to vitamin D supplementation and potentially some benefit there. Um, and so whenever there's something with a little harm and it may actually be beneficial to us, um, I think it's worth considering. The last study I want to mention in the vitamin D and URI category, because I think it was particularly interesting, was there was a study that was published looking at vitamin D supplementation um, and if it reduced the transmission of COVID-19 in healthcare workers. So they chose healthcare workers because um, they are, were at higher risk during the pandemic of transmitting and obtaining COVID-19. Um, I think it's important to mention that this study was done pre-Omicron and Delta, and so it might not apply in the current climate that we see here in the United States of COVID-19. But what they found was healthcare workers who were taking vitamin D supplements were less likely to transmit um, COVID-19 and to get COVID-19. So I think that's just an interesting additional study to support that potentially vitamin D has a large role or a larger role to play in transmission um, and helping our bodies fight upper respiratory tract infections like COVID-19. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit, but we're going to still talk about how we can potentially prevent upper respiratory tract infections um, in our children. So I want to talk about a study that looked particularly at preschoolers, um, and I really like this study because I find in my practice the children who are often most affected by upper respiratory tract infections are those preschool children. So we're talking about children who are less than seven years old. Um, and there's many reasons for that. One is they're a developing immune system. Um, two is they have smaller lungs, and so they tend to have more severe symptoms. Um, and so I think the study was particularly interesting because it focused on that age group. We know here in the United States that children who participate in healthcare are likely to have one to two URIs a month. We know that the symptoms of bronchitis or um, bronchiolitis or in URIs, all three of those pathologies, children often have symptoms for about 20 days. So if you have one or two of these a month and they're lasting about 20 days, that's the entire month your child could potentially spend with um, signs and symptoms of a URI. So I think this was a particularly interesting study and in then it looked at that age group. And so this is a study that was published in Pediatric Research in 2013. It looked at children ages four to seven, so that preschool age range. Um, and what they did was they put an uh, armband or a Fitbit kind of device on all of the children and measured how many steps they took a day. And because of all of the data on vitamin D and vitamin D deficiency and the fact that it can potentially reduce your eyes, they actually put all of the children on vitamin D supplements to reduce that um, 
as being a potentially confounding variable. So all of these children were on vitamin D supplements. They all wore Fitbits um, pretty much 24 seven a day. They took them off to bathe and they took them off for part of the day to make sure that the children weren't developing any rash underneath the armband. And what they found was really interesting, I think. So children who took more steps per day were less likely to have URI symptoms. And so they looked at um, URI symptoms over 60 days, so two months, um, and they found a reduction in symptoms in those children who took more than 7,000 steps a day. So on average, these children were taking about 7,000 steps. Um, they looked at other confounding variables, again, um, comorbid variables like sleep, um, if they had any other underlying lung pathology, they reduced the confounding variable of vitamin D, and they found that the only association between reduction of URI symptoms um, was the amount of steps taken, and they found that that was linear. So the more steps taken, the greater reduction or the fewer amount of days those children spent with a URI. Um, and so for every 1,000 steps, they found about a four-day reduction over 60 days of URI symptoms. So an extra 1,000 steps um, reduce, kind of cut off an extra two days of URI symptoms per month. Um, and so I think that's actually pretty good because there's lots of other benefits to having children get outside and walking around besides URI symptoms. So we reviewed in a previous um, YouTube video, we talked about how... The, that getting outside reduces the risk for children developing myopia. So that's another added benefit to having your child outside. This is just one more. Um, and so I think it's pretty good to, you know, a pretty good push to get your child outside and walking. What I also think is interesting um, is that it did not matter the intensity of the steps that the child took. So whether they were playing a competitive sport or they were just having a leisure walk didn't seem to matter. What mattered was really getting outside or getting inside and getting the movement. Um, and they didn't really explain or have a hypothesis in this study why they think that increased steps in physical activity reduced URI symptoms, but we know that it is really important, especially in these young children, to mobilize their secretions um, and to get them getting that mucus up and out of their lungs, and, that we, and we know physical activity can be a great way to do that. Um, and so I think this is another good example of something you can potentially do during the URA season to help your child maybe spend a few less days sick. The last study I want to talk about because I think parents have a lot of questions about it are antibiotics and their use in upper respiratory tract infections. And, and so this was a study that was published in Pediatrics in 2021, and they looked at treating URIs with antibiotics. Um, and they had multiple definitions for URI here. So it could have been, um, a, again, an upper respiratory tract infection can be limited to the sinuses, which can be called rhinosinusitis. Um, it can be limited to the throat, which we call pharyngitis. Um, it can be in the upper airways, which we can call bronchitis, the lower airways, bronchiolitis. Um, so really, once you get into the lower airways, you're dealing with bronchiolitis, that's a lower respiratory tract infection. Um, and so this is looking from everything up, bronchitis, pharyngitis, rhinosinusitis. Um, and they had three different options here. So they excluded children who physicians otherwise felt strongly needed antibiotics. Those would be children who have an obvious bacterial otitis media, um, obviously strep pharyngitis, things like that. Um, and so these were only children that physicians felt like they did not need antibiotics. And they had three different groups. They either treated some of the children immediately with antibiotics. Um, they did what we call as a watch and wait protocol. So they prescribed the antibiotics, but told the parents not to start them unless the child was getting worse, was having high fevers, um, or persistently having high, medium to high fevers. Um, and then they did a third category, which was just no antibiotics. Um, and interestingly, they found that the duration of symptoms across all three groups was the same. So antibiotics, delayed antibiotics versus no antibiotics, the amount of days that the children spent sick was equal. They found that patient satisfaction, so how happy the parents were with their care, was the same across all three groups as well. One thing that they did find, however, was the children who received antibiotics had the most um, side effects. So those were going mostly abdominal pain and diarrhea, which we know are common side effects of antibiotic use. I think importantly here, they explained and they found that 
the duration of symptoms for the, all three groups was the same, but I think it's important to mention those duration because it sometimes um, is helpful to have an idea of how long to expect that your child is going to be sick, whether it's viral or bacterial. So they found for otitis media, the average duration was about four days. For pharyngitis, about seven days. For rhinosinusitis, about 14 days. And about for bronchitis, about 20 days. So you can expect if your child has a, a viral illness of those categories that they are going to spend that amount of time sick. And they told parents, if your child is sicker for longer than that amount of time, bring them back because then it's less likely to be, um, it's more atypical of course and they would want to see them again. They told parents if your child has a fever greater than 39 degrees Celsius to come back and be evaluated or if your child is having a fever for between uh, 38 and 39 degrees Celsius for more than 48 hours to come back and be evaluated by a physician which are all recommendations that, again, I would probably mirror in my own practice because those are things that are a little bit more atypical and I would want to check and make sure that we're not missing a different infection or that the diagnosis isn't um, incorrect. So we've spent most of the time talking about ways that you can potentially prevent your eyes in yourself or in your children. Um, we're not going to talk a lot about uh, symptomatic treatment or how to treat a URI today, but I encourage you all to go back and look at the YouTube video that I did with Dr. Stephen Gowdery of um, Dr. Nosebot about treating RSV because the treatment is very similar for all your eyes um, and that the mainstays are going to be um, getting rid of the mucus, clearing mucus, um, and supportive care, meaning treating the actual symptoms. So treating fever and pain. We've talked about if your child has a fever, you don't necessarily need to treat every fever, but if they're uncomfortable or they're in pain, you can give them, depending on their age, acetaminophen or uh, ibuprofen, as well as encouraging hydration, making sure they get a lot of sleep, optimizing their nutrition and vitamin D. You can now check off as being one of those. Um, and you know, doing that upper respiratory tract hygiene. So I encourage you to go back um, and take a look at that video because I think it has a lot of nice um, tips and tricks about how to do that. So I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. If you have any questions um, or if you like the episode, please give us a like and a follow. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you all. Please leave a comment below. Um, and again, I hope you enjoyed this and find this helpful in the care of your child and yourself during the upper respiratory tract season. Thank you for watching the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. For more episodes and her practice, visit BeKindPediatrics.com and don't forget to subscribe for more parenting tips wherever you get your podcasts. This information is for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice. Always seek medical advice from a qualified physician.